Uh, good evening, everyone. Welcome this evening, and to those who are watching for the live stream, thank you for uh, your attendance this evening. I want to give a special welcome uh, to everyone in the room. I want to appreciate our sponsor for this evening, uh, which are the executive board, the CDSP, and their, their respective um, PTOs in, in the various schools. Uh, can you give them a wee hand, please, for supporting the event this evening? Thank you. I hope whenever you ask your, your children when they come home from school, what have you been doing today? That occasionally you might get a response of the mood meter. Because that's what it was been, we, we've been implementing now for this particular year. Last year we trained the staff. I want to thank Dr. Mark Brackett for coming. And I, honestly, I don't know to call, whether to call him Dr. Mark Brackett. I don't know whether to shake his hand, bow, curtsy, or say Sir Mark Brackett. And I'm actually serious about that, so we'll fill you in on a recent story. Um, maybe when he gets up and running, he can fill you in there. But we want to thank him for coming this evening. Mark is a, a Yale professor. He's the director of the Yale Center for Emotional Intelligence and uh, the author of the book, uh, Permission to Feel. If you haven't had a wee chance to read the book, I would encourage you uh, after tonight uh, just to get the book along the way. And uh, I think you'll find it very, very, very enlightening and, so, and actually informative after uh, tonight's meeting. Tonight we'll, we'll learn a little bit about a new mindset about social and emotional learning, the mental health of our students, the physical safety of our students, and the social emotional learning of our students is absolutely the first priority. Uh, tonight we have board members who have joined us, uh, we have staff who have joined us, we have parents who have joined us, uh, we have other organizations who have joined us who represent different constituents uh, throughout uh, Darien and representative of the various organizations. We thank you for, for coming this evening because we know these skills, hopefully you'll walk away with some social and emotional skills, some knowledge about those skills, but we know they're developed in communities such as this town, such as in this school, such as your workplace, and hopefully tonight, such as your own homes that you will continue to support uh, the, the skills that Mark uh, brings to us. Hopefully we nugget along the way somewhere you'll take one of my nuggets along the way was simply, I got two kids. They happen to be 28 and like 33. The 28 behaves like a 17-year-old. Oh, oh, this is getting live streamed. I shouldn't really say that. But, <laughs> but I did change my mindset because he's he's, even though he's the tallest one, he's, he's the one that uh, he's the weakest of the, of the two of them. And he is the one that worries me the most, gives me the most challenges. Scott wouldn't mind me telling that. right? But I've learned to change my vernacular just a little bit. Actually, I just talked to him before I came in here. Scott, instead of like, what are you doing? What did you do today? Scott, how are you feeling? And I always remember, as you probably do with your own children, but I never did this all the time. I don't know if it's a boy thing or other, but I changed that. Actually, after talking to Mark, first, first time I listened to him, the last thing I said to him was, I love you, as we ended up our, our conversation. So... I hope along the way tonight uh, you get a wee feeling of what we're trying to do with, with our, our students, your children, um, which is the most awesome responsibility an educator can have. Uh, so we, we invite you to join us in, in that adventure, right, in, in the journey. Uh, I want to thank Mark particularly. Last year we have been through significant loss and we're continuing to take steps forward. When I called Mark to ask for his assistance in that, he changed his plans. He was to fly out to Italy. He came here first. He came to our community to help us and to shepherd us, to shepherd the faculty through that and support the faculty. So some of what you'll hear, most of what you'll hear tonight, you'll you'll get a sense of what the staff heard at the, the convocation at the start of the year. Others will be tailored to you as parents that, in your house. But please do me a favor and join me in giving a very, very warm welcome to Dr. Mark Brackett from Darien. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. I have a mic down. I forgot I have a mic down. 
I just want to make sure you say I love you to me before I leave tonight. <laughs> I'll take it there. from all of you. I need a little love right now. Um, well, glad to see you came out. I was, I, you know, it was where I live, it was raining a little more heavily than it is here. And I'm thinking, like, no one's going to show up on a rainy night. But either you're emotionally bankrupt and desperate for this training, <laughs> or, um, or you're just good people. You're the chosen one. Um, so we've got like four hours, right? <laughs> no, maybe an hour or so to talk about all this stuff. And um, I think some of you know um, that you know, I'm on a personal mission, which is to make Connecticut the first emotionally intelligent state. And, um, and I say that with like conviction because um, I think, you know, I like going to Italy and other countries to do research and work, but you know, I live here and um, feel very attached to making the, uh, our surroundings, you know, places where people get along uh, and get ahead in life. And so with that said, um, I'm just gonna give you resources up front because normally um, I run out and don't show you what you can do next. So if you'd like to learn more, you can go to that website, which is my website. You can follow on social media, only if you're kind. Um, and, uh, you can uh, learn more about the work that we do in companies um, uh, on that right side. So you can take a picture, and I'll, I'm happy to share these slides. Now, that question, how are you feeling, is actually at the core of what we do. And for those of you who are familiar with the movie here, you get to see it again. For those of you who are unfamiliar, I'm going to go a little deeper today. So this is a deceptively kind of simple box. It's just a box of four colors. And um, you might be wondering, like, why are you making me go back to kindergarten tonight? But I'm here to tell you that this is quite complex when you really get um, into it. So on the x-axis, it says the word pleasantness. So all of you woke up this morning. Am I right? You're here. And then on your calendar, like you had your phone or whatever you keep your little diary. And it said, you know. Some guy from New Haven, Connecticut, coming to talk about feelings at seven o'clock. And you probably had feelings about that. Some of you were like, this is gonna be the worst night of my life. And some of you are like, oh my goodness, finally, I have permission to feel. So I want you to check in right now. Minus five, your brain is saying things like, I can't stand this guy. I want him out of here. I wanna go home, I wanna have alcohol. Or you're in the middle, you're neutral. You're thinking to yourself, I could be with Mark. I could be at work. I could be raising my kids. It's all the same. <laughs> maybe you're at plus three and you're thinking, yes. And maybe you're at plus five. You have no words. Like this is the moment you've been waiting for. <laughs> so where are you tonight? Please give yourself that number here. It's private. Whether you share it or not is up to you. <laughs> the y-axis says the word energy. Every one of you has some level of energy tonight. Plus five, you're so energized, you don't want to, you just can't sit in your seat. You want to just get up and jump up and down. Minus five, you're completely depleted. If you ever watched the Wizard of Oz, it's like when the witch gets the water thrown on her and she just like melts into the ground. That's minus five in energy. So what's your body telling you tonight? You're feeling like pumped and ready to learn? Or are you feeling like, ugh? And of course, we take these two axes, energy, pleasantness, and we create these four quadrants, yellow, red, blue, and green. Yellow, high energy and pleasant. Maybe we'll be comfortable sharing what quadrant we're in. How many of you are in the yellow tonight? Green, pleasant but low energy. Anybody in the blue or red? Okay. Uh, I'm, I'm, I'm in there so I'm <laughs> It's all right. You're allowed. So first lesson of ruler, there's no such thing as a bad emotion. We don't have bad emotions and good emotions. I don't know about you, but when I'm around people who are in the yellow all the time, they drive me out of my mind. Like, everything's going to be fine. I'm like, no, the world is coming to an end. <laughs> like, it is really weird out there. Like, your happiness is making me feel uncomfortable. <laughs> Does anyone know what I'm talking about? 
Um, and if you're in the green all the time, it's like, we can't all be the Dalai Lama all day long. You know, like, I'm just present. I actually think those people are weird too. <laughs> it's like, everything's, we're just going to be still. Okay. Um, and don't get me wrong, I'm into being still, but you can't be in the green all day long. You can't be in the blue all day long either, right? How many of you want to be around the blue people all the time? I don't know about you, but there's no hope. Like, <laughs> don't want to hear that all day long. And how many of you want to be in, with someone in the red all the time? Like contentious, right? It's not comfortable. Like nobody wants to be around that energy all the time. So the point is, is that it's not good or bad. It's whether or not that emotion is helpful or unhelpful to achieving your goals. Does it make sense? No good or bad. Feelings are feelings. And by the way, they come unbidden. You don't even have a choice anyway, because life is a roller coaster of emotions. I don't know about you, but I felt 35 emotions in the last hour. This morning I had to give a presentation and I, I got a new computer yesterday. Of course, I was using Zoom and I didn't check. I'm doing a presentation to the entire state of Washington, 150 superintendents, and I got to push share on Zoom. No sharing. My computer, like, all these weird icons came up. It's like, change your security settings. Like literally the first minute of my presentation, of course, I'm like having a little breakdown in time. And I'm thinking to myself, all right, I'm going to wing it. No slides. But, you know, in that moment, highly activated. And then somebody had the bright idea, like, Mark, why don't you just email the slides to the person behind the scenes and they'll show your slides for you. I'm like, oh, good idea. Now I feel better. <laughs> Do you see how quick up and down your feelings can go? How many of you can relate to this as a parent? That one minute your kid is like, I hate you. And the next minute they like, give me a hug. <laughs> and maybe you're like that too. As you can see, I'm in a weird place and I don't even know what I'm talking about. Now, We've got yellow, red, blue, and green. That's not, you can't walk around talking in color because that's weird too. You need language. So now I'm gonna ask you to get granular, get specific. I'm gonna, on the count of one, I want you to find your feeling word or words. You got three seconds. You got two. Freeze. Okay, now I need an honest raise of hands. How many of you had some trouble finding the precise word. Hands up high, really high. Like stretch it out. Look around the room, everybody. Keep your hand up. So we're talking about 90%, right? And you're, by the way, you're like the special people who came out tonight. So you're like the, you're probably 20% higher in emotional intelligence than everyone else in Darien. And you also are emotionally illiterate. <laughs> Any hypotheses around that? Why would it be so hard to find the words? By the way, this is the audience participation part. <laughs> Don't take it offense. I wasn't being trying to be offensive. You're red now. <laughs> Even deeper red than you were before. <laughs> but what's your word? But what's your word? What's your feeling, the specific feeling? It's curiosity. Curiosity, that's yellow. That's not red. You see, you're yellow and you don't even know it. Other, what do you think, what are, what are your hypotheses here around why it would be hard to describe, to come up with the words? Yeah. Makes sense. How much education did we have? Maybe you grew up in a family where like, when you came down the stairs and you were maybe in elementary or middle or high school, you came down the stairs and your father or mother, whoever raised you noticed you and they said, honey, I'm noticing it. Your posture is just different today. No, dad, I'm fine. No, honey, your posture is just a little off in your facial expression. It doesn't look like your facial expression from the last couple of days. No, dad, I'm fine. Honey, come on, let's have breakfast together and and check in with how we're feeling. Okay, Dad. So, honey, what's going on? You know, how are you feeling? I'm fine. Honey, that's not, fine is not granular enough. We need to get precise with our feelings so we can communicate. 
So how are you really feeling, honey? Dad, I'm all, I don't know. Well, let's, let's come up with some words. What color are you in this morning? Looks like you might be in a little bit of the red. Is that true? Well, maybe. All right, let's get deep into the red. Are you worried about something? Are you anxious? Because, you know, worry and anxiety, they're different. And if you add in overwhelmed or apprehensive, that's also different. Well, Dad, now that you mention it, maybe I'm a little apprehensive about this test I have coming up for today. Don't worry about it, honey. Daddy's going to offer you a research-based strategy to help you regularly. <laughs> How many of you grew up in a household like that? I don't know. I didn't. My father was like this tough guy from New York. He's like, you're going to school. My mother was, get to your room. Wait till your father gets home. Great. Can't wait for daddy to get home because he had a master's in emotional intelligence. Now, any other hypotheses? So we didn't learn the words. Yeah. There's so many words. How many? Infinite. Infinite. So it's just like, it's hard to know the words because there's too many of them. Okay. Other hypotheses. You could. You can even have feelings about your feelings. We call those meta feelings. Someone else had their hand up. Yeah, you don't have one feeling. I'm excited to be here, but I'm nervous and I'm tired and I'm also looking forward to something else. Any other hypotheses? Yeah. Really a good point. You know, how many of us men especially are going to walk around saying, I'm feeling anxious. Imagine I run a center. I have 60 full-time staff. And I open up a staff meeting. I'm like, I'm just letting everybody know your leader is having a breakdown. <laughs> and everybody's looking for a job, right? <laughs> like, oh, that's great. The director of the Center for Emotional Intelligence is having a nervous breakdown. But it does bring up an interesting question, doesn't it? Is like, because I knew during the pandemic that half my staff were having a breakdown, right? People were, you know, raising their kids and working full time and in quarantine and like, what's going on with the world and, you know, Windexing their grapefruits. Uh, remember those days? I mean, those were the fun days, right? Leaving, we're, we're going to leave our groceries outside for three days because, I mean, it was what was happening, right? And then people were working full time, kind of, right? Remember, it was like, what is work? The university shut down. And so the question I had was, do I, am I authentic? When we have our staff meetings on Zoom, do I tell people, like, just letting you know, like, it's really freaking weird right now. And I decided to be honest. However, I also decided that it was my obligation to share the strategies that I was using to help me deal with my feelings. So that I didn't look like an emotional wreck. I looked like someone who was a real human being having strong emotions, but also very capable of dealing with it and finding alternative ways to deal with my. I, I, I'm a hot yoga guy. There was no hot yoga in April of 2020, right? Can you imagine going into a closed room with heat going? <laughs> it's like yoga, shut down. And so I had to find new ways of regulating, which were taking long walks. And it really helped. I just took a walk every single day for an hour. And it like just I needed to get out of my house. Okay. So now we're adults who are smart people. All of you are clearly smart people, but we haven't had an emotion education. How many of you would agree with that? That you just most of us didn't have like a sophisticated, comprehensive preschool to high school plus college emotion education. Yeah. And so we got to learn some skills. We got to learn some strategies. Now, I am curious to know from you, it is late at night. It's kind of one of those nights you don't really want to go out. It's dreary. It's cold. You're here in an auditorium. How many of you at some point will get distracted? Raise your hand. Great. So everybody. And we wonder why your kids don't focus in classrooms. <laughs> So then what's your strategy? I mean, let's think about this. You're expecting your kid to go to school every day, 
from 7.30 or 8 in the morning until 4, 5, 6, 7 o'clock at night and be focused. Would you agree with that? You want your kid to be focused in school and be a good learner? I'm only asking to be a good learner for an hour and you're telling me you're going to be distracted. What's up with that? So what are your strategies? When you notice yourself drifting or judging or... Uh, I had one guy who was really had a presentation I did in New York recently. He's like, I'm here to learn. Stop telling stories. I was like, okay. So what's your strategy? Change my posture. Like, yeah, change your posture. Okay, shift. Good. Schedule the time to think about that later. Think about you're gonna like put that thing in, another, in a different parking lot. Mm -hmm. Okay. So you're gonna put whatever distracting thoughts in a parking lot. You're gonna change your posture. Realize that I'm distracted and bring my focus back to what is important. That's very high level. <laughs> I'm gonna realize that I'm distracted and say, no, 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 no. Come back to the present moment. You're not listening. You're not listening. Okay. Other strategies. You're going to breathe? Who is that? Okay, you're going to do a breathing exercise. Take notes. Take notes. Keep my phone away. Keep your phone away. Allow, allow yourself to take a break to refresh. Allow yourself to take a break to refresh. <laughs> I like that strategy. <laughs> All right, so let's think about this. We're coming up with some ideas here. Now, how many of you at some point had a child during the pandemic who had like one of those meltdown days? Anybody have that, one of those moments where you're like, your kid is like losing it because they're like, can't go out and play and they can't go to school. And those are the moments when you're looking at your child and thinking to yourself something like, gosh, this is why I wanted to be a parent. <laughs> as you like bang your head against the wall. And so in those moments when your kid is having that meltdown, I think you should just try this woman's strategy. Honey. <laughs> right, we're just gonna, what is that strategy again? I, I need to add to my strategy the hand. Yeah, but <laughs> I like to embellish. <laughs> So, honey, we're going to come to the present moment. Honey, I know you're having a meltdown, but I want you to just change your posture in your seat. Or breathe. Just take a breath. We recognize the impermanence in our breathing. There's no past. There's no future. We're just here in the moment. And if that doesn't work, listen. i got a lot to say. What do you think? It's tough. And I'm not making fun of you. I think your strategies work. I change my posture. You know, sometimes I like, oh, my God, good, good posture. It helps you focus, take breaths, or, sh you know, shift my thinking. But emotion regulation is really difficult. Would you agree? And how much time do you feel you have dedicated in your entire life to building a repertoire of healthy strategies to support you in being the best possible emotionally intelligent role model for your children. Everybody's like looking like this now. Like, it's like the feeling of shame is setting in. I'm not trying to make you feel bad about yourself. I'm trying to motivate you. So there are lots of words you can use to describe your feelings. Thousands, actually. Someone just said there's lots of words. And I'm going to give you a cheat sheet, a free cheat sheet. So one of the fun things that happened to me during the pandemic was uh, the founder and CEO of Pinterest, many of you know the company Pinterest, um, happened to have read my book. And he reached out to me, he's like, you know, Mark, I'm really interested in this work. Um, and I'd be, I wonder if you'd want to work with me and a team to convert your book into an app. And what we could do is build it together and then make it available for free. And I'm like, that sounds like a good idea. And so we spent two and a half years building an app, my team at the center and his team at Pinterest and outsiders and designers. And we, um, I'm very proud to say, 
we won app of the year from the app store and i just came back from apple headquarters on thursday we were one of 1.4 million apps that got chosen as app of the year and um you can give me a round of applause it's okay um and uh the, the nicest thing about it is that we um, have made a commitment uh, because of generous donations to always make it free and so we want no one to have limitations for having well-being and so right now it's only on ios i apologize for that if you have an android it will be available on android by january uh, but we built it in one platform first to just kind of make it work and then we're going to make it available in other languages as well but there's the mood meter. You got your four colors, yellow, red, blue, and green. You tap a color and you get all of your different words, 144 words with their definitions. And then you get to journal privately. It's all the data are 100% private. You can journal on your phone. You can write a paragraph. You can take a picture of where you're at. You can tag your feelings with who you're with, what you're doing, and where you're at. And then it analyzes the data for you privately to let you know, like I've been in the red when I'm with this person, I've been in the blue when I'm with that person, I'm in the green when I'm doing this kind of thing. A lot of people find it very um, eye-opening because you know, oftentimes the only time we wanna think about our feelings is when we're in the red or the blue. But when, you're, when you set the reminders up to help you think about it like maybe three times a day, you start realizing there are many moments of your day that you're feeling yellow and green. And so you'll learn a lot about yourself. Um, and uh, importantly, in the middle there, we programmed it. We hired uh, a producer in LA and actors, and we trained them on emotional intelligence. And we filmed 36 research-based strategies from different areas. So mindfulness exercises, if you like to do breathing exercises, cognitive strategies to help you shift your thinking, behavioral strategies, um, social strategies, and so on. So please check it out and um, it can be very useful. We're gonna build one for kids as well. That'll be out in about a year. So I thought you should know, educators during the last couple of years have been anxious. Um, and by the way, these data we replicated in a sample of just general working adults, we found exactly the same thing. We found that children have been frustrated, they've been bored, they've been anxious and confused and lonely. You know, one of my most recent studies was very eye-opening to me. You know, we talk a lot about connection. You know, you hear everything, like everything's about relationships and feeling like you have a caring adult or a best friend. This is a study of about 3,000 middle school and high schoolers. And here's what was very interesting to me. And I'm curious to know what you think of this. Almost every one of the kids said they had a friend. They had a, you know, someone, a friend they could play with, a friend they felt like they were, you know, close with. Almost every kid in the study said they felt they had a parent or a teacher or some other person who cared about them. And 90% of the kids said they felt lonely every day. So I'm going to ask you to just think about that. Yes, I have a friend. Yes, there's an adult who cares about me. But I feel lonely. Take a minute. And I'm just curious if you're comfortable doing this. There's people around you. It's time to do the meet and greet. Um, take two minutes. What are, your, what are your thoughts about that? Why do you think children are still reporting feeling lonely, even though they have friends and feel like there's adults who care about them? Go. Cool.
So we're talking about Ellen's insight is no physical contact or texting or any social media. Exactly. Touch or any voices or language or any of those. It's a false connection. Okay, let's come back together, please. So what do you think? What are your thoughts about this? Anyone? Yeah, back there. Yeah. Yeah. Uh-huh. Yeah, really good point. I mean, I even among, you know, students in high school at a certain point they don't talk about college anymore, they don't talk about their applications anymore because like well, I don't want you to know where I'm really going. I don't want you to, you know, apply there as well. So there's a lot of competition, you're right. And also you're right about the, you know, the question is, does, does texting give you that same satisfaction as sitting with someone face to face and having a rich conversation? What do you think? No, it doesn't, right? The same neurochemicals don't get activated. Yes. These are middle school and high schoolers. Yeah. In this particular study. The perception that everyone around you has it together and everyone else is happy and they're succeeding. Yep. And you aren't seeing that in yourself because you know the ins and the outs of what's happening inside of you. Great point. You know, very interestingly, I did a study at Yale where I teach, and um, all the students, everybody says they're stressed. Everybody's stressed. And I'm like, come on, like, what do you got to be stressed about, honestly? Like, you're living, you're like, it's a pretty freaking good life here. The meal plan is pretty darn good. The, the dorms are better looking than my house. You know, you're with other really smart, creative people. Like, honestly, you're stressed. I mean, I have more empathy than that. But uh, I was skeptical. And so I had all of my students journal about the things that they were making that were making them stressed. <laughs> Lo and behold, what I found was all the examples were things like this. His mother has good connections in DC. Her father has great connections in Hollywood. His mother has a big yacht. His father has that. She has better lips. He has better hips. I mean, it was just endless comparisons. And so when I went back to my students, I said, you know, I'm not gonna try to tell you how you're feeling, but in my dictionary, that's not stress. It's envy. And of course, I'm glad I have tenure because I went to the, uh, <laughs> there'd be a letter written about me soon. Um, I, have, I went to the counseling department and I said, you know, what are we doing? You know, what's Yale's envy reduction program? And they're like, what are you talking about? And my point here is that what we are in, you know, what we're, we're, we're a quick fix world, right? You know, while I'm a big proponent of mindfulness, it's not the answer right to life's problems it's one component of helping us be present but you know and our research in the workplace the number one feeling that people want to feel is appreciated and valued i don't know how deep breathing is going to help people have better feelings of appreciation right maybe it's going to help you with your stress or your anxiety or something else but if people are saying they want to feel valued and appreciated and connected, we've got to figure out ways to promote positive relationships. Okay. 
How are we doing today? Interesting? Good. All right, have a great night. <laughs> so what we're getting at here is a model that I think is interesting. And, you know, I'm going to argue that it starts with that concept of permission to feel. Why do I say permission to feel? Some of you may get offended by that. Like, who are you to give me permission to feel? But the truth is, many of us don't necessarily feel like we can be our true, full feeling selves. Has anyone here ever felt like they've had to put on a mask at work? Or with their family? Like, you're feeling something on the inside, but you don't show it on the outside? Am I the only one who's done that? Yeah, so the question is, well, what's the barrier? Why can't you be your true, full feeling self? Well, you don't know me very well. Um, today, I live as a professor. I actually left New Haven. I live in the countryside now. I'm a country boy. Um, that was the pandemic did that to me. I'm like, I'm out of here. Um, but I'm 53, and I'm you know, happily married and uh, feel very accomplished. I still have a lot of work to do, but I feel good about my work and my life. Um, but as a kid, I was chronically unhappy. Um, I grew up in New Jersey. That's probably why. <laughs> um, the Jersey boy. Um, I grew up in Clifton, New Jersey. Um, and uh, I was a failing student. Uh, I thought I was dumb. But what I also was going through was terrible sexual abuse as a child. So I was abused by a neighbor from when I was five years old till I was eight. Um, and I never talked about my abuse because I was threatened by the abuser that if I did, um, I would be harmed and my family would be harmed. He happened to be a good friend of the family um, and you know, knew his manipulative ways to, to do what he did. I finally got the courage to disclose it um, when I was about nine. As a matter of fact, I was cleaning out my basement in my, when I was moving and I found the newspaper clippings from when I disclosed the abuse just recently. And, you know, my, like any parent, my mother freaked out when I disclosed this and she had a breakdown and my father got a bat and went to really do some damage. Luckily, he didn't do that. Um, the man was arrested. Uh, but life got worse for me because it became public. And so I was the kid who basically put somebody in jail. Um, and I went on television, which was not the smartest idea, and it became even more widely um, known. And I started getting bullied because of my abuse, and I started having pretty, really, really hard time in school. And then one day there was this person who happened to be my mother's brother, who, uh, his name is Uncle Marvin. He was a middle school teacher, as it happens, by day and a, a trumpet player by night. And he was visiting us. And he was staying with us one summer because he was getting a master's degree. And we were sitting in our backyard. And he asked me that profound question that I asked all of you in the beginning of my talk, which was, you know, Mark, how are you feeling? But really, how are you feeling? I don't know what it was. Facial expression, body language, vocal tone, presence, as we said. But I decided he was the person I was going to share what had happened. And he didn't say, I can't handle this or toughen up. He just said, we're going to get through this together. And I'll tell you that that changed my life forever. One human being asking me a simple question, how are you feeling? That was it. It wasn't therapy. I did have therapy, thank God, afterwards. It was just someone that connected with me, someone who cared, someone who showed compassion. And so I've been wondering, you know, how many kids have an Uncle Marvin? Not just someone they say cares about them, but someone with whom they believe they can be their true self. And I've been wondering how many adults have that, to be honest with you. And while we don't have time to go into a deep dive into this, I would like to ask you a question around the characteristics 
of the Uncle Marvins in our lives. When you think about the people with whom you feel you can just be who you are, no judgment, how would you describe those people? Please. Sincere. Sincere. Authentic. Authentic. Grounded. Grounded. Anyone? Non judgmental. Good listener. Vulnerable. Accepting, kind, kind. Patient. patient, loving, loving. non judgmental. Those sound like really good parents, don't they? <laughs> so here's what our research has shown. I've done this with well over 300,000 people since my book came out, and I've been recording the responses. Empathic, non-judgmental, compassionate, supportive, validating. I don't know. Those feel good. You ever know? Like when you read those words to yourself, just say the words empathic, compassionate, non-judgmental, supportive, accepting, validating, patient, vulnerable. Doesn't it just make your body just feel at ease? I don't know about you, but when I'm around people like that, I just feel like, uh, when I'm around people who are judgmental, not empathic, not accepting, unsupportive, judgmental, feels a lot different. Now, there's other reasons why you should care about this work. So, some of you, you know, a lot of people, for example, when, you know, I share a little bit about my history, they get uncomfortable. And I understand it. You know, not everybody feels comfortable being, you know, vulnerable like I am. Now, granted, I didn't write my book until I was 49 years old. And I didn't publish until I was 50. And so it didn't, wasn't like it happened for me overnight either. And I'm a psychologist who runs around the world doing this stuff. It took me a long time to feel like I could be my true self in the real world. I felt obligated only because I was just doing a lot of work and everybody would always asked me, why are you so motivated and why are you so, and I would lie and I'd say like, oh, I hated school, you know? But there were deeper reasons, which is, you know, and I recognize, thank goodness that most children don't get abused, but everybody has a story. Everybody has a story. And that story can be one of neglect, it can be one of isolation, it can be one of witnessing endless fighting in your home, it can be whatever it is. And um, so I decided to do it. Now, that's only part of the work. I do believe that storytelling helps, but not everybody. When I do talks for Goldman Sachs, they don't really love my stories. They want the data. And so I'm also a scientist and I'll punch anybody who fights my data. We've got hundreds, if not thousands of studies to prove definitively, I'm gonna say it with like conviction, to prove definitively that feelings are the drivers of these things. How you're feeling tonight is driving your attention. If you're feeling stressed, your brain is going into trying to solve the uncertainty. It's not present. Your emotions are shifting the way you see the world every moment of your day. If you're super excited about the vacation you're going over Christmas, you're also not gonna focus. It's not just like stress, it's excitement too. If you're feeling calm and content and curious, you're gonna be able to absorb the information. Emotions drive decision-making. Has anyone here ever made a bad choice? <laughs> anyone wanna share publicly to just <laughs> get it off your chest? We're all good, we're friends here. So we know that emotions drive our judgments and decision-making. 
Do you know, here's something really interesting. Some of you um, like to exercise, maybe you like to go hiking. So when you're in a kind of, kind of sad mood, do you know that if you look at a mountain in a sad mood, you're gonna misjudge how steep it is? You're gonna actually think the mountain is steeper than it really is. When you're in a very happy mood, you're just gonna be like, I could climb that like anybody else. You also make errors in judgment. Anyone wanna guess what the antidote is to the misjudgment? So what I'm telling you is that certain emotions shift the way we see the world. Like when you're, have you ever noticed when you're, has anyone here ever been in a, in a argument with their significant other? Oh, come on. I know we're, I know we're in Connecticut and we don't share things, but like, it's <laughs> like, I'm, I'm sure that some of you have had arguments with your significant other, your kids. And you ever notice that when you're activated, like you, you like, you can rip them to shreds, like no tomorrow. Like when we met 27 years ago, I knew this was going to happen. <laughs> and everything comes out, right? Every, every memory you have of every time they ever annoyed you, you have had that categorized in your brain and one little trigger and it's like, the list comes out. No? Come on. So we know that emotions affect the way we judge and see the world. Now, the antidote is very simple. It's called emotional self-awareness. When you say to yourself, gosh, right now I'm kind of sad today. When you do this little trick with judging how steep the mountain is, you don't make the same error. So it's not that emotions cause you to make bad decisions. It's that emotions, when they are outside of our conscious awareness, influence how we see the world. Does this make sense? So self-awareness is a gift because it's that you can have all your feelings. It's that you have to be aware of them so that you attribute them to things in a misinformed way. The third is relationship quality. Anyone here ever work with someone who's difficult? Like really difficult? Like you have to walk in eggshells. I mean, what'd you say? How many of you, when you think of that person, say to yourself something like, gosh, I want to work with them for the rest of my life. <laughs> no, it's like, I can't wait. I'll write them a letter of recommendation to get out of here. Emotions are signals. They are signals to approach or avoid, period. Your facial expressions as parents, your vocal tone, is a signal to your children that's saying, approach, avoid, approach, avoid, approach, avoid, approach, avoid, period. Think about it. How many of you want to be around someone who's like this? I have to tell you one more time. Is that approach or avoid? It's pretty much avoid. <laughs> Let's get real. Facial expressions send signals. Body language sends signals. Vocal tones send signals. Just is what it is. Physical and mental health. Little feelings become big feelings when you don't have strategies to deal with feelings. So anxiety becomes overwhelm. Down becomes sadness, becomes disappointment, becomes despair, becomes hopelessness, becomes depression. I'm here to tell you right now that at my institution, meaning the university I work at, since 2017, we've had a 90% increase in students reporting mental health challenges. Not 9%, not 19%, 90% increase. That's a lot. That's not treatable. So if we don't think prevention, I don't know where we're going. The final one is performance and creativity. Now, you know a little bit about my childhood. Um, I was not a you know, superstar student. Um, probably wouldn't, I 
didn't even know what EL was actually growing up. I didn't have that kind of background. And now I got to Yale as a professor in my early 30s. And um, talk about imposter syndrome. I'm like, oh, like your father really is famous and your mother really is famous and they're really smart people and your parents read Shakespeare to you. My parents sent me to my room. And I just thought that everybody with those test scores and those grade point averages and those extracurriculars that I never heard of, they played instruments that I didn't even know existed. They did, volunteered in countries I didn't even know were on the map, all to get into this place called Yale that's supposed to be utopia. And a couple of things. One is, in my research, I find that not everyone achieves their dreams. 75 to 80% of them are being treated for anxiety and depression. So if you think success is like, that's success, I don't know, like, is it really? Like, is success only getting in? Or is it thriving when you're in? And is it like, are we thinking about success only when you're 18 and 19 years old? What about like 25 and 30 years old? Are we thinking ahead a little bit about what we want for our kids? And then I did a study and I asked students not only how they felt, which was stress slash envy, but what do you think the number one hoped for feeling was? How do they want to feel? The answer is loved. That blew my mind. It blew my mind to think that my college students would share with me that the number one feeling that they wanted to feel was loved. And so like any researcher, I asked questions. And guess what the number one response was about why they wanted to feel loved? It's because they said they felt manufactured. They didn't feel like they were human beings. They felt like they were just on this, this program and they really didn't feel like they were living. And so I'm not here to be Mr. Like negative. I'm just here to share with you what, this, what the research is showing and what you know, I think we all want for our kids. We do want them to be happy and healthy and feel appreciated and valued and connected and supported. But I'm just not sure we're like developing and providing them the, the, the circumstances, right, for that to be the case. So what does that look like as we come together? What am I asking of all of you? Well, the first thing I'm asking of all of you is I'm asking you to become emotion scientists. So when someone asks you tonight, like, what did you, what was the goal of Mark's little lecture? You're gonna say, his goal was to help me become a compassionate emotion scientist. Everyone got that down? That's gonna be your tweet tonight. I am committed to being a compassionate emotion scientist, not a critical emotion judge. Anybody ever work for an emotion judge? Ooh or be in a relation with someone like that who tells them how they feel? Why are you so angry? Get over it, move on. I had someone said it to me recently. I got into a fight with a colleague of mine. He's like, let it go. I'm like, you let it go. You were the jerk. <laughs> like, I have to deal with you. I'm not letting it go. Like, why are you telling me to let it go? Passive aggressive, crazy person. <laughs> so the emotion scientist is open and curious and reflective. The emotion scientist views all emotions as information. You know, a lot of dads come up to me and say like, gosh, Mark, you are like over the top vulnerable, like that's scary stuff. You know, like I was bullied too, but I would never let my kid know I was bullied. And I say, well, what if your kid is being bullied right now? Do you think you're creating the circumstances, the context for him to feel safe to share that with you? Wouldn't you wanna know? So learner mode wants to get granular, has a growth mindset. Raise your hand if as a parent, you failed at some point during the pandemic at dealing with your own feelings. Good, you're real people. Um, I had shared once before when I was here the last time that, so my mother-in-law was here for a wedding. Uh, she's from Panama. And so my 
Panamanian mother-in-law flew to New York, Connecticut on February 28th of, Mar of 2020 to come for a wedding that was March 5th, which is one of those weddings that like, it was like that really beginning weird time where you're like, hey. Um, like my friend got married, we're like, hi. Uh, felt like I was in LA. And um, of course, 10 days later, the whole world shut down and Irene, who I love dearly, was unable to go back to Panama because there were no flights. The airline shut down, if you remember that. And they didn't shut down for a week or two weeks or a month or two months or three months or six months, seven months. This lovely 80-year-old neurotic woman was living with us. <laughs> and it got rough because like, I'm an introvert who doesn't like to drink coffee in the morning with anybody. And at any, every morning she'd wake up and she'd be like wanting to make coffee, have coffee together, but she didn't want to make coffee for herself. She wanted me to make her coffee. I'm like, I don't drink coffee with people. Like, I don't like people in the morning. I'm like <laughs> contemplating the purpose of my life from like six to 8 a.m. Like, I don't have time to like have my mother-in-law look at me and like, oh. And it got really ugly in our house. And then one dinner, she just lost it. And she looked at me and she said, are you really the director of the Center for Emotional <laughs> Intelligence? And I was so pissed, I just literally said, not tonight. <laughs> and it was like, boom, household meltdown. Dogs urinating on the rugs. It was a mess. Everybody was really freaked out. And I went to bed that night and I thought to myself, but Mark, you actually are the director of the Center for Emotional Health. Like you wrote this whole book that you're running around talking about and promoting and like teaching all these schools, 4,000 schools across the world are using your program. And you're a mess. And I was a mess. And so with permission to feel comes permission to fail. Like I was in a whole new context and I needed new strategies. And I needed to develop those strategies and how to live with my mother-in-law. But I also needed to work on my mindset. You know, I was having that kind of fixed mindset, like I can't take it anymore. She's not leaving. This is like the end of my relationship. And then I went to bed and I'm like, Mark, like, you're like you teach these strategies, like why can't you apply them in your own house? What's going on here? Like, why are you feeling this way? You know, what, what do you need? What's missing? And I just started getting really curious about why I was so activated. And then I realized one thing that was really interesting. I had no curiosity about my mother-in-law, zero. None of my questions were about her. They're all about Mark, the narcissist. They had nothing to do with like this 80 year old lady who's been sitting in my house for eight months who doesn't wanna go outside and get coronavirus, who's missing her dogs and her parrot, you know? And I had no curiosity, I was no, no empathy, no compassion, none of the things that Uncle Marvin had for me. I just had none of them for her. I was just angry that she was in my house. And all of a sudden, like I transformed and I started having curiosity and we'd have dinner and I'd say like, tell me about a time when you were in middle school and let's talk about this. And we started laughing and then we started like learning about each other. The growth mindset applies to how we deal with feelings. One thing that is certain, life will change. If there's one guarantee in life, it's that life is impermanent. Feelings are impermanent. And so you can approach your feeling life as if it's permanent and you will suffer. Or you can approach your feeling life as if there is impermanence and there's growth. I'm gonna urge you to take that route because it's, it's a better life. I mean, if we're guaranteed that life continues and changes, why would we wanna just ruminate and get stuck in a place that's inevitably gonna to get to change anyway? Does this make sense? Now the emotion judge is totally different, critical, closed, tells people how they're feeling, get over it, move on. They're in knower mode. They clump everything, it's good or bad. And they have the fixed mind. My father had a fixed mindset. Good guy, but he had terrible like ways of dealing with his anger. And he'd say, son, 
this is the way I deal with stuff. You're going to have to get used to it. Okay, I guess I'll get used to it and like become a psychologist. So what are the skills that we're teaching? We're teaching children skills, real skills, like life skills, meaningful skills, critical skills. Nothing esoteric about emotional intelligence. How many of you would argue that self-awareness is a good thing? Yeah. It's your self-awareness. I'm not telling you how to be self-aware. I'm helping you build your own self-awareness. That's what ruler is about. It's about knowing which quadrant you're in and why. Understanding that anger is about injustice and disappointment is about unmet expectations. Understanding that there are differences between and among emotions. That anxiety is not the same thing as stress. What is the difference, by the way? What is the psychological difference between anxiety and stress? The winner, actually, I'm, I think I have an extra book with me. If you get it right, you're going to get a signed book, which is worth like an extra 25 cents. <laughs> so, if you, it's real to me, lady. <laughs> like when I'm sitting at home and watching the stock market go down for the last two days, I'm feeling anxious. Okay. And what's the difference between anxiety and stress? Uh, all right, well, I'm going to make this harder then. Anxiety, stress, pressure, fear, overwhelmed. What's the difference? You got two minutes. I'm going to give you two minutes to think about it. Anxiety, stress, pressure, fear, overwhelmed. Oh my. Take two minutes with a neighbor. What is the psychological difference? Go. Uh -huh. All right, let's come back together. Ba -ba -ba -da -ba. Do, 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 do. Ha 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 ha. Da 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 da. Do, 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 do. You guys are worse than kindergartners. I was in a kindergarten the other day, and these kids, I went, they were, the way they got attention wasn't like, if you can hear me, clap twice. They had like the boop, 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 boop. <laughs> boop, 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 boop. Da, 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 da. See, you can do it too. All right, who feels confident among the 150 or so parents of Dalian, Connecticut? I feel overwhelmed. I'm trying to answer that. <laughs> <laughs> that does not give you the permission to bow out. Anxiety, stress, pressure, fear, overwhelmed. A trauma response is spectrum. Yes. I'm sorry? You have a question? Yes. I want definitions to be precise. I want to define every one of those concepts clearly. 
I want to differentiate anxiety from stress, from pressure, from fear, from overwhelm. So fear is primal. Primal. Yeah, like visceral. Visceral. <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> and then you just come back and you're present. <laughs> anxiety, stress, pressure, fear, overwhelmed. Uh huh. Okay. And what about the other three? <laughs> Too complicated. I'm expecting a lot of all of you. Let me see if I have a slide on this. I do. Anxiety, stress, pressure, fear, overwhelmed. So anxiety is uncertainty about the future can't make those predictions. Stress, too many demands, not enough resources. Pressure, something at stake is dependent upon my behavior. Fear, impending danger, overwhelmed, saturated, overcome by emotion. Now, why am I trying to convince all of you to learn these definitions and understand this level of granularity of emotion? The winner. Name them to tame them. You've read some stuff. Say it again. For sure. Because if they say they're stressed, but they're actually anxious, you might be offering them strategies that might not be the best. Let's think about this together. If I'm anxious, my brain is trying to make predictions about things I have no knowledge of. Right? That's what anxiety is about. What's going to happen? What's going to happen? I don't know what's going to happen with the stock market. Stockbrokers don't even know what the hell's happening with the stock market. How the heck is a psychology professor going to know? So I can spend all day long ruminating and generating hypotheses. That's kind of a waste of time. For years, whenever there was turbulence on a plane, I was convinced I was dead. And then I have a cousin who happens to be an Air Force pilot. And he's like, Mark, here's what the research shows. There's never been a crash because of turbulence. I'm like, never? It's like, no, airplanes don't crash because of turbulence. I'm like, so for the last 10 years, I've been having like breakdowns on flights for no reason. He's like, yeah. So every time I'm on a plane now and there's turbulence, I still look at everybody else to see if they're going to have a breakdown. And then I say, Mark, your cousin Richard has told you there's never been a crash because of turbulence. And then all of a sudden I'm fine. I have a strategy to deal with my perceived uncertainty about my future. When I'm stressed out, like legitimately stressed, I got too many demands, not of resources, I can talk to myself all day long, but I still got too much stuff on my plate and not enough support. So unless I take stuff off my plate or get help, the stress ain't going away. Pressure is very different. As a matter of fact, a lot of my students at Yale say they feel pressure too. They call it stress, but they, it's actually pressure because the pressure is coming from their parents who keep texting them every five freaking minutes while they're in college. How did you do on your test today? What's going on with you? How are you doing? And they're saying they're stressed out, but the only thing that's going to reduce the pressure is by telling their parents to stop texting them, right? If you don't get rid of the outside source, that quote unquote stress doesn't go away. Fear is real danger. So give you an example of that. I moved to this East Haddam, Connecticut. For some reason, I had pandemic decision-making, bought this place in the middle of nowhere land. I have no neighbors. And I'm sitting around. My partner is running around doing work. And I'm by myself in this house. And all of a sudden, a bobcat walks back my window. I'm like, I'm dead. Like, this is like a, I'm never going out of the house. We're dead. The dogs are never going to be eaten alive. Now, what do I know about bobcats? It's the first time I ever saw a bobcat. Of course, I'm like, hey, Siri, what's a bobcat? <laughs> That's the fear of life, right? Overwhelmed is when you're just sort of like, like, you ever have one of those days where like this happened, and that happened, and this happened, and that happened, and you're sort of like, oh. when I'm overwhelmed like that, sometimes I'm like, Mark, just go work out. It's done. Just shut the freaking computer. Go take a walk outside for 10 minutes and get killed by a bobcat, <laughs> right? <laughs> then life will be better. Now, do you understand, does this make sense to you? 
why I'm urging all of you as parents to become more emotionally intelligent. Because the more deeply you understand these concepts, the better able you're going to be to help your kids grow up emotionally healthy. First, you're going to have a common language to talk about stuff. Secondly, you're going to be able to talk about strategies that are going to actually help solve the feeling challenges they might be having. All right, let's all take a nice long inhale. <sighs> so much work. It's all good, though. So I want to end by just sharing with you a little bit about what this looks like in schools. There are these tools that children and the adults who are teaching them are learning here in Darianne. Tools like the Emotional Intelligence Charter, like how people want to feel inspired and peaceful and safe. Words to describe their feelings, like building that mood meter wall in the classrooms to have that language to describe feelings. Even applying it to situations like beautiful artwork. Learning tools like what we call a meta moment. There's a beautiful phrase by Viktor Frankl. Some of you may know who Viktor Frankl was. He wrote a famous book called Man's Search for Meaning. And I kind of try to live by this phrase as best as I possibly can. And here it goes. Between stimulus and response, there is space. In that space lies the power to choose our response. In our response lies our growth and freedom. Say it one more time. Between stimulus and response, there is space. In that space lies our power to choose our response. In our response lies our growth and freedom. I don't know about you, but for me, the pandemic made the space between stimulus and response tighter and shorter, and the fuse got tinier and tighter and tighter. My irritability skyrocketed. My patience was very thin. And so we have tools to help build that space. We call it the meta moment. It's being aware of the things that are activating you as parents. Like, why am I, like, what's, why, what is this? How many of you have things at home that kind of drive you a little crazy? Don't we all have those things? For me, it's like dumb purchases. Like, for me, I have, I'm come from a very, like, stingy background and like groceries that I think are a ripoff are a trigger, like a rare almond milk. <laughs> For whatever it is, I see it and I want to become a murderer. <laughs> I'm like, that is a ripoff. You have been manipulated by packaging. Like, Mark, get over it. It's not easy. And then you pause and you take that breath. You're like, I'm going to build some space. I'm going to breathe. But when my mother-in-law was like, are you really the director? I took my breath. And I'm like, you really need to get out of my house. <laughs> so I needed more space. And I needed to stop and think about who I was as a person, who my best self was. What kind of son-in-law did I really want to be? What kind of husband do I want to be? How do I want to be experienced in the world as a leader? How do you want to be talked about as a parent? Take a moment and think about that. How do you want to be talked about when your kids are writing their letter, letter of recommendation for you? What are they going to say? What are the words that you want your kids to use to describe you as a parent? Anyone have a word? Patient? Approachable. Approachable. Even keeled. Even keeled. Empathetic. Empathetic. Loving. Yeah. Accepting. Supportive. Supportive. So think about that tonight when you get home and your kid is like, why are you late? <laughs> You're going to take that breath and you say, I am that loving, accepting, caring, supportive 
transparent. And you're going to build that space so that you respond through the lens of your best self, not through the lens of the triggered self. That's the power of the tools that we're helping kids learn. <sighs> now, let's all take a nice long inhale. So kids are learning how to do this, by the way. It's really cool. I love this. This is a fourth grade student who um, just takes a picture of himself and thinks about the, his own best self. How does he want to see himself? And this boy said, my best self is selfless, determined, hardworking, and kind. I thought that was pretty darn cool. Of course, I believe no one. And I am a scientist, even when I go visit schools. And I visited the classroom. That's why I have a picture of that. And I looked at that kid. I'm like, that's you, isn't it? And he goes, yeah. And I said, well, I'm really curious. How the heck did you come up with the word selfless to describe your best self? Like, that's crazy. And this boy looked at me and goes, sir, I have determined that the world is becoming narcissistic. <laughs> and I want to be more selfless. I'm like, OK, you can be my teacher. So don't underestimate. I mean, look, that's so, I mean, how creative is that? How many of you would like to have a kid in fourth grade who sees himself as selfless and be hardworking and determined and kind? I mean, that's pretty amazing. And those are his adjectives. The teacher, that's a teacher in Australia, creative, caring, helpful, and organized. This is like in the playground, they think about their best self in the playground, adventurous, risk-taking, kind, Creative and inventing, fair. I'll wrap up by saying that none of this is just opinion. Like we're, we do rigorous research on this. We want to know what works and how it works and how to make it better. Continuous improvement. So what we know thus far is that when schools adopt these practices, we have students who are less anxious and depressed, they have more developed skills, they have greater leadership skills, they have better academic performance, educators are more engaging, schools have less bullying, more positive climates. So let's put it all together. All right, everyone. Raise your hand if you're willing to give yourself the permission to feel. That was pretty good. But remember, you gotta give everybody else the permission to feel too everyone you love, and even the people you don't love that much. Can you strive to become an emotion scientist? Can I get a little nonverbal cue? Yes, I am willing. Yes, sir. Um, maybe you can be an Uncle Marvin. Think about that. Everyone needs an Uncle Marvin. By the way, Uncle Marvin's can be moms and dads and cousins and coaches and neighbors and older brothers and sisters. Remember the characteristics? Compassionate, empathic, non-judgmental. With permission to feel comes permission to fail. I tried to apologize. It worked. I asked for forgiveness. Oh, that one didn't work so well. I did repair the relationship, though. And guess what? Irene is coming back tomorrow. <laughs> God help me. Um, I want to end by saying three last things. The first is that this is life's work. This is not a workshop. It's not an app. You know, you can read my book, and I think it will help you a lot to just go deeper into these skills. You know, I have a chapter on every one of the ruler skills that provides all the science to show you that this stuff is real and predicts very important things about people's lives. But it is life's work. Every day is a new emotion, a new relationship. You meet someone, you meet somebody else, you work with someone, you work with someone else, and you're going to have to continuously develop these skills throughout life. I have a friend, one of my closest friends from high school has pancreatic cancer. And I'm really having a hard time with it. I try to regulate, but I get very, very sad because I love this person. And so it's, life is just filled with 
challenging moments where you're going to have to dive deeply into your tool bag. I'm grateful that I have social support systems. I'm grateful that I have strategies. But sometimes I got to try new ones because like during the pandemic, my yoga was no longer available. I couldn't go to the hot class. So I had to figure out something, I had to replace it with something else. And so just think about it. If you, if you have a mindset that this is like just an endless opportunity for growth, it's very freeing. I'll take them in one minute. I'm going to wrap up and then take questions. The last two things I want to say is that I um, am very, it's very important to me for every one of your children to develop these skills, but I'm convinced that focusing on the individual is not the right direction. That the way to really make change is to focus on systems. And I just want to call out Alan, your superintendent, who has decided to do systemic work in the district. It's not one classroom. It's not a random workshop here. You know, I was invited to speak to every single person who works in this school district, the classrooms, the principals. Now families are learning this work. That's when real change can happen because we can build a common language throughout the entire community. So when I'm in that coffee shop on Main Street in Darien and I'm, you know, waiting for my latte, I'm like, hey man, you're putting me in the red there. Like that is not good coffee. The coffee shop guy's going to say, oh, you're the ruler guy. I'm going to be like, yeah. And then we're going to have a conversation about healthy regulation strategies in the coffee shop. And it's not going to be weird. It's going to be like, this is the way we do stuff here. And so I'll end by saying one last thing. Oftentimes um, in these kinds of workshops, you know, I think they go pretty well. At least I hope today was interesting for all of you. Um, and people will come up to me and say, gosh, Mark, you know, thank you. And I appreciate that. And some people say, but, you know, even with all the trauma that you had as a kid, like, you made it. And I say, I, you know, yes, I feel unbelievably blessed, even with all my childhood stuff. I do feel like I have made it in some way. However, I had a lot of supports and a lot of interventions to help me get to where I'm at. I had Uncle Marvin. I had two parents who loved me dearly, although they didn't have emotional intelligence. They knew what they didn't know and they got other supports for me. What you don't know about me is I have a fifth degree black belt in the martial art. I became a martial arts teacher. You get a lot of confidence when you have a black belt and you become a fifth degree black belt. <laughs> so if you don't like my presentation, we can take it outside. Um, I got a PhD in psychology and I spent 25 years of my life writing about this stuff and teaching it. So like, I put a lot of effort into my emotional development and I'm still a work in progress. And so I want to figure out ways to not make that random. I want to make, figure out ways to make sure that every child from preschool to high school gets the emotion education they need to live the life they want to live. And I hope that um, tonight was an opportunity to help you uh, see this in important ways. And um, some people like to think about it as getting on a bus. So tonight I drove my little ruler bus to Darianne. And some of you are like, thanks for coming by. <laughs> and some of you are like, I'm going to get on the bus, but I'm going to sit in the back of the bus. So I'm going to see how this thing goes for a little while. And some of you are going to be like, no, I'll come up front. And some of you are going to say, Mark, no, I want to drive the bus. And so I'm looking for more people to drive the bus. And um, you're all welcome to get on the bus. And I hope this is helpful and important. Thank you. <laughs> Thanks, everybody. So I recognize um, that we're at time. Um, and I recognize that you have lives outside of talking about feelings. But how about I please feel free to go if you need to go. Let me take maybe three <laughs> questions or four questions. And then you had your hand up, please. It's not a bad thing. Yeah, I can, I'm, that's what I'm working on. But for me, um, it's not about the, the sadness, it's about the, the loss 
like I, my brain is focusing on the loss and I'm trying to help myself kind of be with my sadness. And that's the hard part. That's what I'm working on. So like embracing your sadness? Is yeah. What you mean? Like embracing Allowing myself to just be a good friend for the next six months, but recognize the impermanence of that friend. It's hard when you've been with friends with someone for 37 years. Well, permission to feel is about authenticity. So it's a, just a different way of thinking about it. But authenticity is a, a good word. Yes? So when, obviously, this is a lot of work. And a lot it's a lot of, of work. Change, but, right? but that's why it's life's work. you got all the time to do it. So when you're implementing it into schools, how are you convincing the schools to take more time with this learning and take a little bit less of academics? I know there's some yeah. academic and there is. And, and I, personally, I would much rather my kid be, you know, socially emotionally mm -hmm. healthy than this yeah. trying to strive all the time. And, you know. And so it's a good question. I think the good news for you is that ruler is not something like that's this add on. Right. It's like, so we're doing a lesson in history. And it's like, let's talk about those characters. How do they feel? How do those feelings impact their relationships? What strategies did they use that were helpful, that were unhelpful? What do you think about that? What might have been different if they had used different strategies? What strategies do you think would have been more helpful? So in many ways, it actually enhances academics and gets people to think more deeply about the kind of study, whether the Boston Tea Party or whatever it might be. Are they, are they receptive to that, the schools? In, in Even Darianne's except. Darianne obviously is, but you know, in terms of yeah. taking away that. When you, when, they, when you educate them properly. You know, like if you think of social emotional learning, you know, as this like, like touchy feely add on thing, you know, that's not our model. This is rigorous stuff for me. You know, I'm, I'm actually really interested in helping people learn critical skills to manage relationships and be healthy and make good decisions for whatever they want in their lives. And I think when you th frame it that way and elevate it, um, as opposed to think of it as like, something that's just sort of like the add-on thing on Thursdays where we get in a circle and talk about our feelings, then people start taking it more seriously. And when you show the research. Yes. Please. Yeah. Yep. So at the high school level, it's much more about, you know, helping students engage in prospection. What does that mean specifically? It's like creating a vision for what I want my high school career to look like. What are the friends that I want to have? How do I want to perform academically? What are the extracurriculars I'm really interested in? What do I want for my well-being? And how do I achieve it? Like how many of us, nobody asks me about my well-being goals in high school. <laughs> and so like if I have a well-being goal or I want to, you know, be the, get my black belt, well, what skills might I need to help me have the focus to go to karate class twice a week, three times a week? What are the barriers to me achieving that goal? How do I deal with those barriers? It's really much more about helping kids think critically, you know, about what they want and it build the skills they need to achieve that. So it's more personalized. Does that help? The, the good news is that it's so much more about the students and the teachers at the high school level. Teach, we don't want this, the, the goal of our high school work is not to be the sage on the stage. It's really just asking kids critical questions like, what do you want for your high school career? What are you interested in? Let's think about how are we gonna achieve that? What do you think you might need to achieve that goal? How do we help you achieve that? It's much more about the students than it is about the adult. Yeah. That's okay. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I want to be a doctor, I want to be a lawyer. They're like, what kind of person do I want to be? 
That's even more interesting. Yeah, that's a hundred percent aligned. So I just gave that as one example, you know, in terms of goals. But you know, goals are important. You know, it is important to learn how to set goals. So, for example, you know, when I was writing my book, I was hard. I'm, a, I'm, a, I'm an academic. I don't write books for real people, and it took me a long time to learn how to write in a way that was more interesting and open and storytelling. My articles are very journalist scientific, and so I had a vision. Like, I, I, you know, I was like, am I going to get this book done or not? And like, I don't know, it was like not like, it was like a fantasy for me at one point. Like, I'm going to write a book. And then I'm like, all right, what's my vision? I'm going to be at Newark Airport, and that book's going to be on the bookshelf. I'm going to see that book. What's well, far, it's a long goal. It's a far away goal. I haven't even started writing yet. So if that's my vision, if I want to feel that sense of accomplishment, going back to your feeling state, I need to be able to figure out how to how to do that because I have no skill, I have no strategy, I don't know what to, I don't know what to do. So if that's my vision, well, what's my strategy? You know, how long does it take to write a chapter? Do I have an outline? Do I have a publisher? <laughs> do I have an agent to help me get a publisher? So, like all the things that we need to achieve, the things that are going to bring us that joy, is important to figure out how to do. And then I set strategy. And then I, all right, so if I'm going to write a chapter a month, which was ambitious, took me really two months to write every chapter, which is two years to write one book. For me, that was, you know, I, I'm also teaching, I'm a, I'm a, you know, I have a life. And so how much time do I need to dedicate every week? And then what's going to get in the way? Like everything is going to get in the way, like my mother-in-law. <laughs> And so, like, how do I deal with the things that are going to get in the way of achieving? Does this make so? It's really, you know, part of this work, and that's my goal. I don't want you to have my goal. That's what I'm interested in. That's going to bring me joy. For you, it's going to be something else, and that's that's great. We want kids to be curious about lots of things and whatever they're curious about, but we also want to help them understand that there are very specific steps to achieving those things in life, and developing the, the skills to do it. Um, and that's just one piece of it. Um, the other piece of it is that, you know, I can tell you right now, um, not having goals for well-being has created the mental health crisis that we have right now. I've seen in my 20 years at Yale go from 10 counselors on campus to over 50. That's not sustainable. And so if we're not helping kids identify the things that are going to help them feel, um, bring them a sense of contentment in life, not always happy, but contentment, um, I'm really worried, you know, about we don't prioritize well-being goals. Um, and we only prioritize like the stuff that you're afraid of, like this, all this kind of striving and academic goals. Um, it's it's going to blow up. It's already blowing up, unfortunately, in terms of the well-being of, of our students. Um, and I know we're running out of time. I'm happy to take more questions afterwards. Let me take the last two, and then, you know, Alan wants to go to bed. <laughs> and I actually have to go. I got an hour drive home. So. I have a statement, not a question. Please. I, I think that as part of this community, it is overwhelming, right? And we have a lot happening with our students, mm -hmm. but I think what resonates the most with me from this presentation is that it's life's work. We want instant gratification. Yeah. We want our kids to be happy. We want them to succeed today. Yeah. It's not a one day thing. No. It's not a one classroom. This is going to have to happen on the Appreciate and that. And importantly, you know, going back to what some of the conversation was on this side, is that maybe the goal is not always to try to be happy. Maybe the goal is to be comfortable with how you're feeling and give yourself the permission to be anxious during a pandemic. Because, like, why wouldn't you be anxious during the pandemic? I think the mindset is that anxiety is bad and we have to get rid of it, as opposed to life is filled with, with times when we're going to be anxious Let's learn how to be anxious 
in a comfortable way because it's a real emotion. And we're not the only ones that are anxious, even if they look from the outside. Correct. So I think a mindset of having well-being as opposed to being happy is a, is a slightly better way to look at it. I'm going to stop here. I apologize if I didn't get to answer your question. I'm happy to wait a few minutes and do it privately. And I just want to thank you for taking the time out of your life to learn about this stuff. So have a great evening. Thank you. Thank you, everybody.